you so much, Michelle. If you are on Facebook, it is likely you have discovered it is not simply that you can follow people, but you can also be part of groups and follow what's going on in those groups. And there's just gobs of different groups about all sorts of different things. And uh, throughout the course of my life, I've been a fan, among other things, of gospel music. And uh, at some point in the past, I've began following this group called Good Old Gospel Songs. And um, that, it has been an interesting following uh, as I have been part of that group because what's going on in that and on that page is that you'll have individuals that will record themselves singing. And so sometimes it's with an instrument. Maybe they're playing piano. Maybe they're playing guitar or whatever it is. And they're, they're going to be singing whatever song it is. And typically it's going to be like in their living room or a den or an outhouse or whatever it is that, <laughs> whatever it is that they are recording this. And uh, I'm telling you, some of these things are pretty memorable. They are really, really memorable. And um, in truth, I, I don't get it because in truth, I'm not lying. Some of the worst singing I have ever heard in my life that has ever crossed my ears has been part of that group. And some of the most, I mean, just tone deaf caterwauling you have ever heard in your life. And I'm thinking to myself... If I sounded that bad, why in the world would I record myself and then put myself out there for limitless numbers of people to, to watch and to listen to this? Uh, so, so I hear some of that, but then there are some folks that you're like, man, this, they've, they've got a wonderful voice. God's really blessed them. And then there's that other group. And as I am hearing what they're saying, you can see the comments that people are posting. And some of the comments that people are posting, I kind of get. I'm with you as they make some of those. Like, for example, I saw one the other day, and I'm telling you, it was just, it was horrible. I mean, like, your ears wanted to bleed. And uh, the, the comment on there was, your singing just makes me cry. I'm, I, I'm there with you. I really am. I, I, I get that. I am, I mean, tearing up as we, we speak. And then sometimes, and I'm telling you, a really, 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 really horrible, horrible singing uh, and sometimes you'll have some of these people that write their own songs and they're, they're completely off pitch and it sounds terrible, just terrible. And then you'll see in the comments, people will say, that's just beautiful. Keep up the good work. I'm like, really? Shouldn't you be saying like, I'm going to report you for putting a virus on the internet or... I mean, this is terrible. This is terrible. But uh, the, the question is, why would somebody put that on there? In fact, why would it bother me that somebody would keep saying or saying to them, hey, good job, keep up the good work, keep putting this out. Why would I, that bother me? Because that's encouraging them. That's encouraging them. Now listen, I understand you all, we all understand this, every one of us needs encouragement. We do. We need people speaking positive things into our lives and, and cheering us on and to be uh, an encourager of whatever direction it is that we're headed. And so we want that, we desire that, but one of the things that we need to make sure that we do is this. We need to make sure that we encourage the right things. Because we shouldn't encourage everyone for everything that they do, because some things do not need to be encouraged. Some of these singers need to be encouraged. Well, thank you for sharing, but please never do that again, right? So we need to encourage, but we need to make sure that we encourage the right things. Hold that thought for a moment and consider with me this reality. Over the past number of weeks, we've been looking at, in the Gospel of Luke, some of the different seasons or stages in, the li in, in a person's life. And so the first week we looked at childhood. Last week we fast forward because all of our students were still away, uh, coming back from a retreat. So we went to adulthood. But today we're going to back up and think about the season of adolescence and early adulthood. And as followers of Christ, those that you have that are in that season of life, that are teenagers, that are early adults, what is it that they, what do we need to be encouraging in their lives? Because we don't just want to encourage everything. We want to encourage the right things. So, what should followers of Christ encourage among those that are in the adolescent season of life? I think we see the answer to that today in uh, Luke's Gospel, Luke chapter 18. If you would look with me there in your Bibles today, Luke chapter 18, and we're going to start reading with verse 18. Luke 18, starting with verse 18. Jesus is approached here in verse 18 where we're told that a ruler asked him, Good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Why do you call me good, Jesus asked him. No one is good except God alone. You know the commandments. Do not commit adultery. Do not murder. 
Do not steal, do not bear false witness, honor your father and your mother. I've kept all of these from my youth, he said. When Jesus heard this, he told him, You still lack one thing. Sell all you have and distribute to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven. Then come follow me. After he heard this, he became extremely sad because he was very rich. Those in the adolescent season of life, so teen years, early adulthood, they need encouragement, just as we all do. But among those of us that are further along the road past that, what do we need as followers of Jesus to be encouraging in their lives? Well, based on, I believe, what we see here, the first thing we need to do is this. Pay attention to the fact that moral and individual responsibility should be encouraged. Moral, moral and individual responsibility should be encouraged. What we have just read here is described, you find it in each of the Synoptic Gospels. And in Luke's Gospel, we're told that this young man is rich. In Matthew's Gospel, we're told that he is young. Now, the word that he uses as young doesn't give us a definitive age, but it suggests that this, this guy is somewhere maybe around 20 years old, perhaps even a, a tad younger. But he's, he's on the, the early end of life, and so he's probably coming out of teen years. He's established now as a young adult, and that's an interesting season of life. And as he is in this season of life, in many ways, he's doing pretty well for himself. Again, Luke tells us here that he is wealthy, that he is financially blessed. So already, early in life, he's made a stack of money. But he is described as being a ruler. And the word that is used as ruler is one that likely indicates that he had some measure of official capacity, uh, some sort of leadership position within the synagogue. And so, uh, regardless of all those details, we don't know exactly. We're, we, we're, we're given somewhat of a, a glimpse of this young man and where he is in life. And there's a lot that we can praise him for. I mean, for one thing, he's already out of the gate. Seems like he's doing pretty well in life. He's got a good job, probably with uh, his money. He's got a good, uh, a good, nice home. It's well furnished. He's got a fast camel. I mean, he's, he's doing pretty well, right? And so, beyond that, we can praise him for this that he is not simply thinking about the moment. He's not thinking about just right here and right now because he goes to Jesus. And we don't know exactly what experience he has had with Jesus prior to this, but it, it stands to reason that he has heard Jesus speak before, that he has encountered him, that he has listened to him, that he has been impacted by what he has heard from Jesus because he goes to him and he, he describes Jesus as being good, and he also seems to understand that Jesus can answer this question, how eternal life can be experienced. So we ought to praise him for the fact that he's thinking beyond just right here and right now. Especially as somebody that has a lot of stuff, that's got a lot of material possessions, he's thinking beyond this, realizing that the material things of life are at best temporary. And so he's thinking beyond this, that at some point this time here ends, and then furthermore, we ought to celebrate the fact and praise him for the fact that he's realizing and understands that there is life to be experienced beyond this life. That what we experience here is not just all there is. And with that in mind, he goes to Jesus, suggesting, and more than suggesting, confirming the fact that he understands and believes that Jesus can answer that question. He understands and can communicate to him how it is that eternal life might be able to be experienced. And so as he goes to Jesus, and so all, there's all this stuff that we can praise him for, he goes to Jesus and he says, The teacher, what must I do to gain or inherit eternal life? Jesus says, Why do you call me good? No one is good except God alone. But this is an affirmation uh, by Jesus of his divinity, saying that you're calling me good, only ultimately God is good. This is an affirmation ultimately of who Jesus is, God the Son. And then he says to this young man, he says, you know the commandments, and begins to rattle off half of the Ten Commandments. He says, do not commit adultery, do not murder, do not steal, do not bear false witness, honor your father and your mother. And in hearing this, the young man says to Jesus, I have kept all of these things from my youth. Now, the fact that he says to Jesus, I have been doing all of this stuff, and each of those boxes you have just given to me, I can check all of those. In fact, I have been doing that since I was just a little guy. 
That suggests a couple of things. For one thing, it suggests that he was taught these standards. That he couldn't have maintained these standards were he not taught them. And from the earliest ages and stages of life, he was exposed to the boundaries that God has put up for us to operate within. And as a little guy, he was told, among other things, about these, what we describe as the Ten Commandments. And he understood, hey, these are guardrails that God has put up for me in my life, and he expects me to operate within them. Not only does it communicate that he was taught these things, but it suggests also that there was accountability established. So that not, it wasn't merely that he was told, hey, you need to honor your mother and father. Rather, it is beyond that. It is expected, and we are going to hold you to account for honoring me as your father, honoring me as your mother, to, to not steal, to not uh, bear false witness. You're going to be telling the truth, and we're going to hold you to account for all of that. And all of those things are so wonderfully positive. In short, what I'm trying to say, though, is that as an adolescent, as a young adult, this young man has been prepared, equipped, and well-versed in accepting personal and moral responsibility. You say, okay, I've, I've got that. Well, what do you, what's, what's the point? The point is this. Unfortunately, too many times, especially in this modern era, we give young people a pass for entirely too long. In fact, as we do that, we do so with cliches like this. We will describe the folly of youth. In fact, we'll say that's just being young and dumb, right? In fact, we'll, 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 you'll, you'll see something on the news, you'll witness something in uh, the neighborhood, you'll see something maybe at church, teenagers, adolescents, they're, 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 they're doing some crazy stuff, and we'll say, oh, that's just the folly of youth, or that's just being young and dumb. Put another way, it is effectively saying, oh, that's just how they are. That's that stage that's just kind of what you do. And by, by using statements like that, what does it do? It effectively permeates, not permeates, but, but causes that to continue. And it effectively excuses bad decisions and bad choices rather than celebrating and encouraging personal and moral responsibility. Let me illustrate this way. If I were to say to you, I've got to go to the DMV this week. And thankfully, thus far, I don't think that I have to. If I were to say that, you may say, Ugh. But if I were to say, hey, you've got to go to the DMV this week, you would really groan, right? Because of this weeping, wailing, and gnashing of teeth, it's horrible. None of us likes to go to the DMV. And if you had to go to the DMV this week, let's say you had to go to the title office, or you had to go get your driver's license renewed at one of the, the driver's license offices, it is likely, not guaranteed, but it is likely that you will come back after having been at that appointment, having gone to one of those offices, you may very well say, man, I had a horrible experience. But, but think about that. If somebody says to you this coming week, hey, I had to go to the DMV today and I had a horrible experience. I had to wait forever and I had curt, almost rude service. If someone said that to you, what would you say? Well, well, duh. You, you were at the DMV, right? In fact, we can even groan at the thought of going to the DMV. Why? Because we know that's just kind of how it is. That's kind of what you expect. It's like, for example, going to Hardee's and leaving and saying, man, I, I, I had Hardee's for lunch, but I had really slow service. Well, of course. You went to Hardee's. That's, that, that, that's exactly what it is that you should expect. That, that's just how they operate. Um, part of the reason, for example, that like, if you hear someone talk about, and we even jest about politicians being dishonest, right? In many ways, what we, well, we, that's just how they are. And when we make statements like that, we are effectively excusing that behavior and causing it to continue. 
And when we just say, oh, that's just being young and dumb, we're not helping them out. We are not advancing the cause of them becoming more like Christ or beginning a relationship with Jesus because what they need in that season of adolescence is not us excusing behavior, but rather encouraging personal and moral responsibility. Why do we need to encourage that? Because God is going to hold them to account. And as teachers, as parents, as grandparents, as Sunday school teachers, as youth leaders, as a church, as a community, this is the type of behavior that we need to encourage. Don't make statements to excuse it, to minimize it, to say that it doesn't matter because what they need, especially among those that are followers of Jesus, they need those in their life that are encouraging moral and personal responsibility. Thankfully, this rich young ruler experienced that. It had, the standards had been erected, accountability had been maintained, and that was good. But that's not all that he needed. He needs something else, and that's this. That pivotal expressions of, of lordship should be celebrated. Pivotal expressions of lordship should be celebrated. So, Jesus is asked this question by this rich young ruler. Hey, what, what is it that I need to do to experience what is it that I need to do to inherit eternal life? And this is, this is a passage from uh, some of the other Gospels that I have preached before. It's almost certain that you have, if you've been in church long enough, you've heard a Sunday school lesson, a Bible study at some point, dealing with this particular uh, incident. Again, it's recorded in each of the three synoptics. And so, having been exposed to it, it's possible, in fact, even likely, that as you read this, as you've heard this, you read this exchange between Jesus and this young man. Hey, Jesus, what do I need to do to inherit eternal life? And then you hear Jesus' answer. And what does he say? He starts talking about the commandments. And the guy says, okay, I've, I've already done that. I'm a, one through five. I, I've checked all those boxes and have been doing that since I was a little kid. But then Jesus says this. All right, so uh, after doing that, you still lack one thing. Sell all you have and distribute to the poor and you will have treasure in heaven, then come follow me. It is likely, having read this or studied this at points in the past, you didn't like Jesus' answer. Do you like it? I mean, if you're honest, you're probably thinking, no, I don't really like that answer. And it's not suggesting that, 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 that your dislike or distaste for Jesus' answer is because it's, it's an implication towards poverty, that he's mandating poverty. He's not doing that. So, so why is it that we may not like his answer? Well, for one thing, Jesus doesn't say something about, well, you just need to believe. Does he say that? Hey, good teacher, what must I do to experience eternal life? Well, you need to believe that, that I am the promised one of God sent to pay the, the ransom for many. He doesn't say any of that. He's talking about the commandments, and then he talks about going and selling stuff, and then giving that to others, and then he says and invites him to come follow him. Come follow me. Those two words, follow me, I believe to be particularly important in what Jesus is seeking to communicate. Not just to this young man, but to every person in every generation since. That at the end of the day, what Jesus was looking for and what he remains looking for is this, people who will follow him. If you are following someone, what does that suggest? It suggests that they are the leader, that they are charting the course, that they are establishing the path, that they are establishing the boundaries. Uh, to give it a more technical title, it's, it's suggesting lordship. Jesus has been and continues to look for people that are willing to follow him, effectively making him the Lord, the master, the director, the guide of their life. But again, Jesus, he's, he's not giving a belief answer. Why in the world do you think that that's the case? Well, I believe the context bears out that in this young man's mind, those issues are effectively already settled. I think he already had an understanding, a faith-based concept about who Jesus was. Because, again, he goes to Jesus and he says, Hey, good teacher, what is it that I need to do to gain eternal life? So, he already, before he goes to Jesus, he believes and understands Jesus knows how it is that I can experience eternal life. 
by Jesus' own words, he says, no one is good except God, but you're calling me good. It's an affirmation that Jesus is not just someone special, but this is God the Son. And this young man is doing that. That suggests that that the things that he needs to believe, those things are in order. Beyond that, he, he believes that God has established some patterns for our behavior. That he's put some boundaries up in life that we need to operate within. And that those are for our good because he says, hey, I've been taught this and I have been doing those things since I was just knee high to a grasshopper. I've been doing that all of my life. All of those things are wonderful and all of those things are positive. But why is it that he leaves empty handed? Why is it that the gospel writers describe him as leaving Jesus as sorrowful? The reason is because Jesus gave this man a a test case. He gave him an opportunity to do what he said and to follow Jesus. He didn't just say, hey, believe this series of facts. Get a few ideas straight in your mind. But you are going to follow me as the leader. And the young man decided, I cannot do that. I will not do that. Now, the problem is, he had a ton of right belief. He did. I believe he had the right belief about Jesus. He had the right belief about God's pattern and his desires and expectations and standards for our lives. I believe that he had all of those things. He believed that, that there is life beyond this life, that God is the one that gives eternal life, and that Jesus is the one that makes it known and possible as to how to experience that. But he leaves empty-handed because when given an opportunity for Jesus to be the leader, he decided, I'm not willing for that to happen. I really believe that adolescence and early adulthood provides a pivotal opportunity for an expression of lordship. That your teen years in particular provide an opportunity for you to decide, it's not just that I believe some things to be true, Rather, it is that I believe them to be true in such a way that I am willing to follow Jesus with my life. In the case of the rich young ruler, it seems that his childhood and his early adolescent years, they were marked by consistent teaching about God, about spiritual thoughts, and it seems that his response in each of those areas, it was positive. There was a whole stack of things that he believed and accepted to be true, and that's good. But again, he left empty-handed, Because at this point, he's out of the house, he's on his own, he's making his own decisions, and he is no longer experiencing what mama or daddy or the preacher or the Sunday school teacher is trying to influence him to do or impose on him. At this point, he is making his own decision about whether or not it is that he isn't simply just going to believe, but whether he is going to believe in such a way that it translates into following Jesus. He's at a stage where he is owning his own decision, whether he is really in or not. We've got six kids, and uh, for five and six, that's Peter and John. They have something that, honestly, I wish, and I don't think it was around with the others, we just didn't know about it. Uh, But what those two have had is, um, is this bike. It's a training bike that doesn't have any pedals on it. Um... I think they, they call them balance bikes, and there's different brands of them. I think the first time we saw one was on Shark Tank, and they happened to have one at Costco uh, one time, and we, we got it for Peter. And I, it's, it's very simple, and I, I think in, in many ways it's ingenious, but you've got this little bike, and it's got everything like a normal bike, except there's no pedals and chain on it. So for you to, to move about on it, you sit on it, and you, you put your feet out, and you start going. What's interesting is that even as a, as a little type, what begins to happen is that they start moving around and they get longer and longer spurts where their feet are off the ground. And they're learning to balance this bike. And the thought is that once they get to a, a size where they could get on a pedal bike, they've already got the balance thing down. All they have to do is just start pedaling. And sure enough, with Peter, he was the, the, the quickest, easiest uh, among our children to be able to learn to ride a bike because of that experience. Now, what the others experienced and what they had was what so many of us had. Well, I, I didn't have, maybe you did, or maybe with your children or grandchildren you had this, but you do training wheels. Training wheels. You know how training wheels work. You, you have a bike, but then you, you put, they have these little 
brackets on the back that add additional wheels, and it, it keeps the bike from falling over. Now, the cool thing about training wheels is that you can take a kid who's never ridden a bike before that has no idea how to ride a bike, and you put them on that bike, and they can ride around, and they can go fast, they can go slow, they can brake, they can pedal, they can coast, they can steer to the right, they can steer to the left, they can do all of those things, and they're not having to worry about falling over. Why? Because the training wheels are there. And it, it holds them up. It keeps them from falling. But one of the things I don't like about training wheels is that it's, it doesn't really prepare them for when they actually come off. Because at some point, the training wheels come off. And at some point, you've got to learn to balance. What I'm, I'm saying with respect to that is that when it comes to following Jesus... Early on, we, we are operated kind of like with training wheels. For those of us that grow up or are growing up in Christian homes, we have a mom, a dad, a Sunday school teacher, a preacher, a church. We've got friends. We've got people that are investing in us. And they are sharing with us biblical truth. And they are, are pointing us to Jesus. And all of those things are good. All of those things are important. Candidly, I think all of those things are necessary. And what we are trying to do is to shepherd their heart and guide them towards Jesus but at some point, those children become teenagers, and as they become teenagers, as they go into adolescence, later adolescence, into early adulthood, they get out of our homes, they're off in a college dorm, they're away at school, they're at a party, they're at a friend's house, and the training wheels are off. Mama's not there. Daddy's not there. Sunday school teacher's not there. And what we need to be doing is operating in such a way and celebrating along the way and encouraging them and pointing them to own the decision themselves. So that it's not just merely, hey, do you think some stuff is true? But do you think this is true to the point that you are willing to follow him? To do what he says when daddy isn't around, when mama is not watching, when Sunday school teacher is not there. Because eventually the training wheels come off. They do, and it's going to be up to them whether or not they are actually going to follow. This young man has the training wheels off at this point. He is in early adulthood, and there are so many things that he's doing that are right, and he's experiencing by any worldly standard tons of success. And with respect to faith and matters of spiritual thought, there are so many things that he has straight in his mind, so many things that he accepts to be true, but he does not follow Jesus. So what does it say to us? It says that this is an important season of life. Those teen years, those early adolescent years are important because the training wheels are coming off. They are experiencing greater and greater freedom. And we should not just take comfort in the fact, well, they, they, they were taught enough facts. They've got enough data. They've got enough information. We need to be celebrating these expressions of lordship that outside of our presence, they are following Jesus. We need to celebrate that because that's part of the process of owning this. It's not just believing it, believing it to the point that you are willing to follow Jesus. It does stink that during one of the most tumultuous seasons in life, which our teen years are, early adolescence, early adulthood is, we're making some really important decisions, aren't we? What are you going to do with the rest of your life? Are you going to get married? Who are you going to marry? Are you going to go to college? Where are you going to go to college? What kind of job are you going to do? Are you going to assume debt? What are, you going to, are you going to buy your own house, rent a house, buy a car, rent a car, new car, old car? What are you going to do? So many important decisions that, that you are facing. And one of the, but as consequential as those things are, and as regrettable as we may say it is to be making those decisions during this season of life, we still have to make them. We're making decisions of grave, grave consequence, including, among other things, whether or not I'm really, really going to follow Jesus. To our students that are here today, let me just say this. I was intentional in not sharing this message last week because you weren't here. Because I want you to hear this. You are in a stage right now where you are deciding whether or not, not just that you believe the right things, but whether you believe them to the point that you are willing to follow Jesus. Already there are times, seasons of time in your day, in your week, in your month, in your year where mom and dad aren't around. 
where you don't have a teacher, you don't have a Sunday school teacher, you don't have Jamie, you don't have me, you don't have uh, some of your other youth leaders looking over your shoulder to see what's going on. And those are going to give you opportunities to decide, not just do I believe, but do I believe to the point that I'm willing to follow Jesus. My encouragement is do not be like this young man. He leaves empty-handed. And there's so much that we can praise him for, but one thing that we cannot praise him for is that he wound up being a follower of Jesus because he wasn't. Listen, I don't want to just celebrate in our student's life that you get a good education, that you have been taught a lot of right things, and that you get a great job. I want to celebrate ultimately that you are and you become a lifelong follower of Jesus because at the end of the day, that's what he was looking for then. That's what he's still looking for today. you bow your heads with me? What's true for all of us is what I just said, that Jesus was and is looking for followers. Not just people who think a series of facts to be true, but that you believe these things to the point that you are willing to follow him. If he asks for something difficult, you're willing to do that. Why? Because you really believe. And you really want him to be your leader. And you are willing to follow him. Now, regardless of your age or stage, have you made that decision? I'm not asking, do you think some stuff is true? I'm not asking, do you believe in God? Do you believe that Jesus is God the Son? Even the demons believe that to the point that they tremble. Satan would kneel, he would not follow. The rich and ruler would not follow. How about you? Will you ask the Lord to help you see what it is that you've got in terms of your relationship? Is it a collection of facts and data? Or is it one where you're actually following Him? I can't answer that for you, but God will. I think He'd love to help you see the truth about that. And if it's not, will you allow us to share with you how you can experience that? If you're watching, will you allow us, will you reach out to us and let us share with you how you can experience that? But specifically to those that are in teen years, early adult years. Listen, the training wheels are coming off. Some of you, the training wheels have already come off. And the faith that you were told about, taught about, the facts that you were communicated you're having to decide whether you're going to own those or not. Whether you're really in this. Whether you're really going to follow. What's it looking like? Is your answer to Jesus, yes, I will follow? Or is it, I I can't do that. I can't do that. What he's wanting for you today is to decide, no, I'm in this. I want more than anything to follow you. I believe you and in you to the point that I'm willing to follow. Parent, grandparent, those of you that have been investing in the life of your kids, not just bringing them to church, but sharing with them biblical truth, listen, I applaud you. We celebrate that. Maybe you've got a burden, though, for your kids that you want to make sure that they're owning this. Do you want to pray that God will help you to see ways in which they are making Jesus the Lord of their life so that you can celebrate that with them, that you're operating in such a way that you are pulling the training wheels back so that they can begin to own this and celebrate it as they do. Maybe you just want to pray that God will give you guidance as you're trying to shepherd their hearts and point them towards Jesus. You can't make their decision, but you can influence it. You can point them towards Jesus. You can encourage them to become a real follower of His. Maybe you just want to pray, God, help me to do that. However it is the Lord is speaking to you, whether it's for decisions about yourself, maybe it's some young person in your life that matters to you. As God is speaking to you, will you respond to Him this morning? If you want, this altar is open. If you want one of us to pray with you, we'll be glad to do that. But as He's speaking to you, you respond right now.